Welcome back to the Nikki Clark Radio Show. The show is about conversations that matter, and we invite people from all walks of life to come and share their heart stories. And we're so excited to invite our uh, amazing guest, Dr. Mendoza, who's the founder and the uh, of the nonprofit organization LifeUndocumented.org, and the executive producer of a self-funded documentary uh, that speaks to his personal story as an undocumented immigrant and to publish data on undocumented immigration. So this documentary is an official selection of the 2019 Toronto Documentary Short Film Festival and the 2019 Oaxaca Film Festival. So please welcome Dr. Mendoza. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, Pleasure to be on, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And is it okay for me to call you uh, Dr. Mario? Mario, what would you prefer? Whatever you feel most comfortable with, uh, Mario is completely fine. Mario is great. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know you are very, very busy uh, doing wonderful things in the community. So let's get right to it. Tell us a little bit about your background leading up to what you're doing today. So uh, first of all, thanks for for making the time and, and really allowing for this platform, essentially having focus on undocumented immigrant advocacy or migrant advocacy work is important because at the end of the day, the reason I'm doing this is really to highlight the reasons why folks are emigrating from their countries of origin or migrating to the United States and often to other countries as well, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and typically escaping horrific conditions or in the case of in the Northern Triangle where there are three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, Mm -hmm. sometimes an economically unviable future. But going back to what led up to this, or led up to this, is um, I quit my job uh, working backwards in July of 2019. I was most recently working in biotech. I'm an anesthesiologist by training, and I did do clinical work at the NIH a few years back after residency and working at the FDA. So I have Mm -hmm. a little bit of um, pharmaceutical industry experience, and I I left that job because I felt that it was the right time. And when I say I felt, it's really a calling for me. And so it's uh, something deep within me that told me that was the right time to go and really drive the nonprofit the documentary is from 2016, so it sat in the back seat for a little bit. I decided it was it's time to go, and as you know, with the current environment and the current administration, it is a timely feeling that, that I have. And the, the remit of my mission or of life on documented.org is something, at least from my perspective, from what I see so far, is innovative, and that is, uh, very succinctly, it combines real-world immigrant stories or stories directly from undocumented immigrants or migrants and real-world immigrant data that does not exist right now. The current data on undocumented immigrants is from the U.S. Census and what's currently published. I want to collect data directly from undocumented immigrants. I'd like to collect the stories and data speak to both, not only to humanize the migrant or the immigrant in the media, and have it be a factor, that human factor, of course, in immigration policy, mm-hmm. uh, but also to defend and speak up for via data in terms of demographics mm-hmm. and what do their stories look like in terms of actual numbers so that you can really intelligently speak to the migrant population and what do those folks look like in terms of their lives Absolutely. on paper. Absolutely. Well, it's um, it, it's quite an, an amazing um, accomplishment, uh, you know, what you're trying to do to collect all this data. And I know that uh, you, you have your own um, journey uh, of uh, experience in, uh, I believe it was in 1981, at the age of seven, you actually walk for 12 hours overnight uh, to the, you know, the U.S.-Mexican border. Can you talk about that experience? Sure, absolutely, and, and that, as you could imagine, is one of the inducing factors, I think, in, in what I call, uh, or that deep feeling that I have, which to me is uh, deeply set from God, not of my own, I'm simply obeying. And mm-hmm. that feeling largely comes from my own background, my family's background. So in 1981, my mom, who was 38 years old at the time, my brother was 15 and I was seven, we, all three of us were threatened to death 
uh, mm. via a phone call from the Salvadoran government to my mom's school. She had been a teacher at that point for 20 years, mm-hmm. and she was told that if she didn't leave within a month, that she, all three of us would be killed. The reason for that is because at the time, mom was working on teachers' rights, better work environment, and better pay for teachers. And so the government or the Salvadoran government branded that communism, and they threatened to kill her. We applied for political asylum. That's an important detail, and we were denied. So I, I think if, if we, our family situation under death threat, does, we did not apply or we did not uh, have a valid reason for political asylum. I don't know who does, to be right. honest. I don't know why we were denied. Because of that, what's a mother to do? So we fled for the United States. Absolutely. And I was supposed to be driven across, but I ran across for 12 hours overnight across the uh, Tijuana Desert, across the U.S.-Mexican border. I, I can't even imagine. Um, I, I would have to say the, the trauma that you experienced, uh, the, um, the experience must have been overwhelming. Is it something that you uh, maybe kind of relive now, or is it something that you've made peace with? You know, it, it's a uh, yes to both of those questions, actually. And uh, the reason I sound, I sound so calm when I'm delivering on this and speaking about it is, part of the answer. In other words, I can't live in trauma and anger or pain every day. And because of that, I have to to stay uh, joyful in God and at peace with it. But I do find that in the last few years, which has really been the only time that I've finally have stopped with my education and work and had time to look around, I started to digest a lot of this trauma, it seems. And so... I do remember helicopter lights hiding from bushes across that desert. And I can tell you it has had an impact on my mental health and it has been a traumatic or traumatizing experience. And if you can only imagine if that was traumatizing and I wasn't at a detention center, what it must be like for folks that are in the U.S. detention centers and experience even further trauma. Uh, In recent discussion with mom, she Mm -hmm. cried, and going through this story again, I got even more detail from mom than I I didn't know about before, about our journey. And it is still very traumatizing for her to speak uh, to all this. She said that the only way they could ever separate her from my brother and I at the time would have been to shoot her dead. She never would have allowed that. My goodness. My goodness. Well, so this is really um, something that uh, you and the family have been working out throughout the years, I imagine. Um, uh, Like, I am just amazed at your strength. And uh, as as I said to someone a couple of days back, you never know what strength you have until you're stretched to that point. Um, But uh, really, I I applaud you and and taking um, this very pivotal time of your life and, and using it as a way to bless others in improving the state of their lives and also to document um, the, the, these issues uh, that are so important and they must be discussed uh, in, in order to um, get people to where they need to be. So I, I really, um, I have so much um, real, I, I, I have a lot of um, respect for what you're doing. So, Dr. Mario, um, can you tell us, uh, you know, how has your life been transformed from all of this? Like, I have my own kind of gathering of, of how it probably is unfolding for you, but how has it been for you over the last few years? So, what I can tell you, and I'm assuming, did you mean by that just life in, in general, dealing with maybe the trauma of the migration journey yes. or the nonprofit itself? Um, the nonprofit that you've developed. Sure. So um, the documentary, a uh, self-funded documentary, the whole goal of that was not to get into a film festival. So I really see that as a huge blessing from God, I think, uh, grace that I don't deserve. Uh, so very happy that it has that platform because at the end of the day, as I mentioned before, I'm speaking up to highlight my story and currently published on Documented Immigrant Data to really in defense of undocumented immigrants. But at the end of the day, it's to give those migrants or undocumented immigrants a platform. It doesn't stop with me. I'm powerless without all of these stories, really, as a collective. And so and what do these stories really speak to? Again, as I mentioned, 
the reasons why they're fleeing the countries of origin. And as I said, uh, people question why folks are doing that. They maybe need more elucidation as to why people are fleeing such horrific conditions and the fact that they are horrific. Uh, what I can tell you is that it's been difficult in getting folks to open up, as you can imagine, to speak about their stories. And so part of my, my work is really engaging with folks and building those relationships with undocumented immigrants. And where do I meet them? Just about everywhere, uh, via asylum clinics, uh, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, here in Jackson Heights in New York, everywhere that I look, to be honest, of all nationalities. We know just a little bit under three quarters of undocumented immigrants come from Latin America, but about 13% come from Asia and Southeast Asia as well. So let's not forget about that. And in the conversation. So, but, so what I like to add to this is work in the Northern Triangle in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. So that's a recent decision I made. I will be moving to El Salvador in September of this year to embark on that work to film not only the migrant stories there, the coffee farms, sugarcane farms, but the effect of climate change and that, how that's closely interrelated to migration in the Northern Triangle. I will also plan on running a study here with asylum clinics to speak to why folks are seeking asylum. And so I'm, I'm looking to work with a few clinics so if we publish that data, and again, an advocacy of the migrant or the undocumented immigrant. So it, it's been tough in that folks are afraid sometimes to speak to me to be associated with what people consider a sensitive topic. From my perspective, though, it's that much more painful to watch folks being tortured in U.S. detention centers at the border. We know that they're not being uh, supplied with basic care, medical care. As an MD, that is the first thing that I think of. The food and, and the lights and the cold floor, as they've referred to them in Spanish, la hielera, which is the freezer or the refrigerator, as those, some of those detention centers are referred to, are really inhumane conditions. Uh, but as an MD, to, to, to have these migrants not even be given basic medical care and be allowed to die, and most recently a 16-year-old teenager that died from the flu, an easily yeah. preventable case, an easily preventable death is really just for me unacceptable. And so I will give all that I am to this work, and that's why I quit my job to run this fully. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, definitely life-changing, and uh, through that, you've become an, a change agent. So uh, I want to thank you so much for you know, sharing um, your pearls of wisdom, and I'm really proud of everything that you're doing. And, and how can people reach you on social media, Dr. Mario? Thank you for the kind words, and, and thanks for the um, social media platform as well. It is important, and uh, I'm at life undocumented that's one word at life undocumented on twitter facebook and instagram as well uh bear with me uh i, I say to the audience i'm trying to get a little bit better about instagram uh, <laughs> i'm not quite a boomer but i am a little bit older i'm not a <laughs> millennial okay. so i'm trying to teach myself and improve on that <laughs> <laughs> that's okay i only found out about tiktok just a few, couple of days ago so uh, it keeps evolving yeah it, you, you have to keep up but uh, definitely right. thank you so much so uh, we'll reach out to you on uh, your website, and uh, you're still working on some other areas of social media. But, again, thank you so much uh, for your time, and I wish you all the best uh, in everything that you're doing. Thanks, Nikki, for the time, and thanks for the kind words. Uh, as I mentioned, it's really Jeremiah 29:11, and I attribute all this to God, his grace, and that's what's driving me. Amen. Well, you've been listening to the Nikki Clark Radio Show and be listening, actually um, hearing the the wonderful um, journey uh, shared by Dr. Mario Mendoza. Uh, So please uh, check out his website, and uh, we look forward to the many wonderful endeavors that he'll be uh, engaged in in the near future. So thanks again, and all the best. Bye for now. Thank you, Nikki.